Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Tara Hall. I'm a media and program specialist here at the Framingham Public Library. And welcome to this month's Lunchtime Learning Series program, South American Myths and Cosmology, a focus on food with our very own Pamela St. Pierre. Uh, before we get started, I just ask that if you haven't already, if you could please silence your cell phones. Uh, there'll be time at the end of the program for questions, but we ask that you do save your questions until the end. There are evaluation forms at the back of the room, and following this program, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it, along with any um, program ideas that you have for future lunchtime learning series or anything else. Our usual Friday night film, which takes place the first Friday of the month, uh, will take place next Friday, October 13th, and it's a showing of the silent film Nosferatu, and it's accompanied by pianist Richard Hughes, so we hope you can join us. Uh, along with that, there are flyers for some upcoming programs at the back of the table, along with copies of our October newsletter, if you'd like to learn some more. And now, it's my pleasure to welcome local artist and our very own, Samuel St. Pierre. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Uh, welcome. Uh, let's see. So. This is the second part of a lecture series, um, but we'll go over a little bit of the context uh, that was gone over in the first one, just so we're all on the same page. Um, first of all, um, my name's Samala. I'm a local artist here in Framingham. I paint in watercolor and ink, um, and feel free after to check out the original paintings at the back of the room. And, um, and I also work here at the libraries on circulation and children's and reference, and you, you guys probably seen me around. Uh, I'm of Peruvian and Dominican descent, which is what got me into all of this in the first place. And I loved, I just like loved stories of mythology and hearing about the past and history and all of that. And that's what delved me into this project. So who are we even talking about? Who were the Inca? The Inca are a South American civilization that became the largest empire in the Americas, North and South. They're ethnically Quechua at first, um, but as the empire grew, they absorbed other ethnic groups and uh, indigenous groups, uh, such as the Aymara, and this is why people to this day will still claim Inca ethnicity, uh, although it's um, all these different groups of uh, ethnic groups put together, and descendants of such. So what were they famous for? Why are we talking about them today? Well, they were very impressive engineers and builders. They used tier terrace farming. They used earthquake resistant, mortarless building methods of stone. They famously cr uh, created Machu Picchu, depicted here. Um, which was like the lost city. They were calling it in the 1940s when it was rediscovered. And they also created an extensive Andean road uh, system that covers over 20,000 miles of footpaths and rope bridges. Uh, and they were used by a network of chaskis, which were message runners. So people would run messages from one end of the empire to the other incredibly, incredibly quickly. Where are we talking about? So we are talking about an empire that stretched 2,500 miles through modern day Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Bolivia, and northern parts of Argentina. Even the most western parts of Colombia were parts of the empire at the very at a moment right before their decline. So quite a vast amount. But you'll see it's just on the western, western coast and Andean um, mountain, mountain area that we're talking about. They weren't able to stretch into the east, into the rainforest, into the Amazon rainforest, uh, because the tribes there, the people there, were so good at evading and uh, just dominating that area and truly had no interest in joining into what the Inca had to offer. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So when are we talking about? At the, uh, about 1200 to 1533 
AD. Um, so this is when Europe was in the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. So if we're looking, generally people got uh, around what time that was. Uh, and we are actually going to delve even further back than that to around 500 BC. So today we will talk about what led up to, what led up to the Inca Empire and then during, a little bit after the Spanish conquest. So we, many of us know, like in the beginning, in the beginning, people were hunters and gatherers. So they would hunt. Uh, meat and they would gather, they would forage for plants, and then sometimes they would have some basic horticulture. And so, the so they would kind of tend to the plants that did well for them, right? So we wouldn't call this agriculture because they aren't necessarily planting them, but maybe they would protect the berry bushes that were good to them. And then there's this, and then it's like, oh, the the farm revolution, the agriculture, agricultural revolution, but there's all of this stuff in between and it didn't quite happen the same way everywhere around the world. So if you were to ask the Inca of the time, if we travel back in past, they would tell you, actually it did happen overnight. And it happened overnight because of the, this god and goddess, Manco Capac, or historical, heroic, mythological figure, and his wife, Mama Okio. These two god, this god and goddess were entrusted by Vira Cocha, hello, welcome, Vira Cocha, the creator god, to find a land suitable for his people. And they ended up in the Cusco Valley, um, and, which is super fertile land. The story goes that he was given a golden staff, and anywhere where the first place that the staff sunk into the ground would be this promised land. Like, they have a mandate from God, this is where we will start this Inca civilization. Lo and behold, the staff sinks into the ground in the Cusco Valley. His wife, Mama Okio, was tasked with domesticating the people. So, taking them from their rags and nudity into wearing these, like, fabulous text fabulous textile clothing, teaching them how to spin yarn, um, spin wool into yarn, uh, teaching them to domesticate animals like the guinea pigs, called kui, um, and llamas and alpacas, and how to domesticate uh, plants as well. So if you were to ask the Inca emperor of those years, you would say it happened overnight. And we know that that is... Um, not true, <laughs> but it was a great marketing campaign for them uh, because maybe in the beginning everyone knew it wasn't true, but a couple hundred years into the empire, and you don't really know, uh, you know, there wasn't Wikipedia back then, and so there's no reason to believe that that's not true because maybe the surrounding people are, um, do have less of these things to offer. So actually, we're going to travel even further back in time to when that shift really did happen. So before, even before 500 AD, we're talking like 7,000 years ago, bands of people in South America would travel in groups and occupy an area for maybe two years where they would hunt, gather, do some horticulture, like a little bit of, of planting of of plants that already existed there, and even uh, they were even beginning to domesticate the the animal uh, the, the animals there. However, after two years, this pasture land—it's not like the Great Plains in, the, in North America—they would become depleted, and so they knew that they'd have to move again. So these were a semi-nomadic people who would set up these temporary houses. Um, and structures that just needed to last two-ish years before they would move. And they would rotate like this around the land, avoiding other groups and uh, leaving the, the areas that had already been eaten up, all the grasslands, uh, to replenish. 
Now, those would have at least two years to replenish, but they had more than two sites. So they would have even decades to replenish before returning there. So they had this um, balance with the natural world in that, yes, they were using up the resources, but they also knew when to stop before it was irreversible. And so the Wari are really one of the first great civilizations of South America, and they don't get spoken about that much because we know even less about them than we do about the Inca. Um, and oh, that should say BC. OK, so imagine that that's 500 BC. So this is a really long time ago. The Wari decided to begin collecting, collecting these groups of wandering folk. And how do you do that? You offer them something that's going to improve their lives. And that was the first city planning, stone buildings, and a centralized religious system that included the staff deity that we see here. And this changed or encouraged more domestication of animals because as you're not moving around as much, the hunting of animals becomes more difficult because you don't want to deplete the natural population. So the shift from hunting and gathering to pastoral nomadism, right? So like shepherds who, who wander, um, is not linear. It's a combination of farming crops and raising herd animals for meat and wool. And that's really what we see, what we see here with the Wari conquest. Um, yes. So, so there needs to be a flexible mix of pasture raising for animals and cultivation of plants because the land is so unforgiving when it comes to droughts, floods, and just general weather chaos. And so pending if there is a drought and the plants are not doing well, they would depend more on meat. If the, um, the llamas were taken out by a disease, uh, then they would focus more on the farming. So when it comes to llamas and alpacas, which are probably like the most famously domesticated animals from South America, although the guinea pig also, uh, we have a god for them as well. And his name is Urcuchille. And there's actually not, so I'm working on this painting, but there's actually not a great depiction of him as described in the texts. So. He's the Inca god worshipped by Inca herders, and he like protects all animals. And he's a multicolored male llama with a human body. And so the closest I could get was Marvel Comics did actually have Urcuchie Ur in one of his in one of their comics, uh, not episode, but um, issue Earth six sixteen, and. That's their version of him. So imagine that, but rainbow. And you basically got this really like, he's, he's kind of, he's like very aggressive actually. So to protect these herd animals that so many bad things can happen to, you've got this like battle hardened, uh, what's it called? Uh, llama headed God. And so where do llamas and alpacas even come from? So on the left is a vicuña, which is the wild version of the domesticated alpaca. So the, and then we have ah, guanacos on the left and domesticated llamas on the right. How does that even happen? And what is, what is even the difference between like a wild animal right on the left and like the domesticated one on the right? A lot of it has to do with the familiarity with humans. So if you walk up to a deer, it's going to act really different than if you were to walk up to a cow, which is not a perfect equivalent metaphor since those are not related. But they're also like selectively bred for their, um, for their wool, for their size, for their health. And this has been going on for uh, thousands of years. In something called the Great Hunt, or the Great Jackal, every four to five years, a great drive of thousands of people, this is before the Inca, this is before the Wari, and during, 
people would drive these animals to a central corral, the wild ones, the guanacos, the vicuñas. They would drive them to, um, to a corral, basically where they're stuck, 10 to 15,000 of them. So this was like a big operation of massive organization. And they would be shorn for their fleece. So literally, they would be grabbed and then like shaved down to collect all of the wool. The weak, the sick, the otherwise undesirable ones were killed for meat um, and also to make the herd populations healthier. So you don't want disease to, to, um, to spread, so they would take out these diseased animals from the, the wild herd. This developed into domestication because the best ones from the group started to be taken for domestication. So the largest animals were used as breeding sires. The, um, the rest of the herd were all released, right? So 10 to 15,000 animals in one place. You take all their wool. You keep the best ones for domestication. You kill off the sick ones, and you release the, the rest back to the wild every four to five years, because that's how long it actually takes to grow that, may, that wool to a length that is going to be conducive for fiber making. Uh, da, 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 da. Four to five years. Yeah. So in times of desperation, it would be four, and in times of um, in, in times of like not desperate need, it would be five, like pushing five, and it would always happen in the springtime, as well. So you want to wait longer to get longer um, longer threads of fabric, but you um, but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. <laughs> and the same is true for domesticate for the domesticated llamas and alpacas. You still have to wait this four to five years to get the full length, but through selective breeding, they have thicker, fuller, woolier, softer coats. So as domestication techniques improved, um, animals were selected primarily for fleece, as I just said, but they also had Right, and the fleece, the wool would be used for clothing, uh, for slings, for blankets. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you still see today sold in the markets, and even up here, you can get um, alpaca sweaters and socks and all of that. Um, that's been going on. That's just been going on. Um, but the hides were also used, so the skins of the animal to create sandals, sleeping robes, rawhide ropes, the tallow. Um, so it's like the fat of the animal, it's called sebo, uh, is used for medicine, uh, sacrifices, and incense, because it burns slowly. The bones were used to create tools for weaving, leather working, um, as well as instruments. So really every part of the animal is being, is being used here. The dung, or takia, is used for fuel, because it's slow burning. This is, like I said, on the mountains, there's not the trees that we see here in Vermont. There's not the Amazon, uh, like those kinds of trees for, for timber or for, um, rather for like fuel for fires. So this is an alternative, similar to how cow dung is used in India um, or camel dung in Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. And, oh, and they were also used for religious and uh, sacrificial rites. And of course, the meat could be used during hard agricultural weather. Like killing a llama for meat is a very expensive bet against your investment because they have all these other purposes. So having a, having a lively large stock would just was more profitable. So it didn't happen that often. Um, but was definitely was definitely an option for hard times. When domesticating uh, llamas, they keep all the females and the young together, and then they have a couple males that are good for breeding, but the rest of the males just create a ruckus. 
<laughs> and their wool is actually not as good as the female wool. So they take all the males and they use them for the wakaiwa, which is a llama caravan. So you cannot ride a llama. They're not bear, they're not um, beast, bear, what is it? Burden bearing beasts. They're not like, they can't pull a plow. They're quite thin actually under all of that fur, under all that wool. Uh, but they can carry sacks of potatoes, grain, and other goods on their backs. And so there would be like thousands of these llamas on these Inca roads that would that would travel back and forth. And that's what the the not good for uh, not used for breeding male llamas would go. Okay. So, what other purpose do they have? They're a symbol of status and wealth. The Inca Empire did not, and the Wari Empire, the Tiwanaku, the Nazca, they did not have money. They, but they did have wealth. And llamas, and the size of your herd of llamas or alpacas, was a symbol of that. Because we're, we're, they're working in a organization of trade and bartering. And so what's the best thing to trade for? Well, we just listed all the great things that you can get out of llamas. And so that is, that is going to have really high trading value. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this, back to the whole trade idea. Um, so what are some of the challenges that were faced and why I just spoke about llamas for 10 minutes? Because uh, it was so heavily dependent on these, these animals is because growing vegetables at a high altitude setting, uh, which is considered higher than 5,000 feet, and we're talking about places that are uh, over 13,000 feet as well, uh, is challenging because of poor soil, a short growing season, high wind, uh, the weather, a lack of a flat ground, and really high UV exposure. So how did the people tackle this challenge? Well, for the lack of flat ground, i.e. mountains, they invented terrace farming. This is one of the most advanced farming techniques that we've really seen in the whole world. And what they basically did was cut these terraces, these steps into the land itself with stone retaining walls. And then the top here where you see grass in the photo, that's where the farming would happen. The retaining stone walls didn't just hold in the dirt. They built up a solar mass of heat during the day. So during the day, the sun would shine on them with this high UV light, heat up the stones. And then at night, when it would get super cold, you had all of this heat still protecting the root systems of the plants. So they would survive whether that they really otherwise wouldn't have from being hit by the wind. Also, they were lined with gravel at the bottom before they hit the stone of the mountain. And so you have stone, gravel, soil, crops. With the rain and irrigation systems we'll speak about, the walls actually held this extra water in the gravel. And so during times of drought or lack of water, it would be reabsorbed through. So these were like giant plant pots with a bunch of like reserves for water underneath. Because they were stones without mortar, if the water were to freeze, it would just bulge out instead of cracking like our sidewalks do every year in Boston. Uh, all right. So next, poor soil. So where do you even get the soil from on a mountain? Well, one of the ways to <clears throat> Uh, one of the ways that was, was worked out is this irrigation system. So from the tops of the mountains, there is snow. And the snow melt and glacier melt was co would come down the mountain haphazardly. The Inca were able to reroute this snow melt in, and rain, uh, rain that they would catch in cisterns, like in big basins, into these canals that snaked down the river, uh, not, down the mountain, 
in particular ways so that they would hit all of the farmland necessary, but also they would go into um, public baths and places for people to drink water, and they would keep those separate so that um, as you went down the mountain, you were still able to access, access clean, clean water. Um, ah, yes, a little, a little side note for another little goddess side story. This is uh, Waita Bayana, who's had her heart broken from the, from her lover, the dragon god Aimaru, who is slain out of vengeance. Has nothing to do with her, but she's obviously very affected, so much so that they say that her heart froze over and she laid down and her whole body turned to stone and ice. And she is the frozen mountaintops down in that area. And that if she were ever to melt, like defrost, that she would destroy the land in her despair. And we, what do we see now? We see lots of actual like floods and mudslides from that exact thing happening, um, which is a result of climate change and warming and just the glaciers and the snow melt just going too fast. One last little thing about snow melt and about the Andes is that there, the water picks up minerals as it goes down the mountain. And actually, it feeds into the Amazon River, which is the largest river system in South America and is full of all these amazing nutrients. That all starts at the source, at the source, which is the Andes. So elevation. So domesticated crops existing. So they domesticated crops that already existed that were hardy to wind, temperatures, uh, extreme temperatures, and high UV exposure. So this is the change from horticulture, which is just taking care of the berry bush you already found, and actively, selectively choosing the things that are going to be best suited for the area. So the crops that work best at a high elevation, we're talking 12 to 13,000 feet above sea level, are tubers, which are like potatoes, um, and grains like quinoa, um, and we'll get into these other, uh, the kanima, oka, or yuko, mashua, um, next slides or so, but I just want to show an actual photo of these guys because they look like they're all potatoes, but they actually have a bunch of really different flavors and ways of cooking. So first we'll talk about Aksomama. She is the goddess of potatoes, but tubers in general. <clears throat> so she's the one that you pray to for a good potato crop. There are over 3,800 types of potatoes grown in Peru alone. Oops, there we go. Um, and including the, let's see, the oca, um, which is similar to yams. It's a stem tuber. Oyukos, they look like potatoes, but they actually have like a slimier, waterier texture to them. You can eat them raw, but they're mostly used in stews and soups. And then mashua, which is a... Um, uh, also kind of looks like a potato, but it's more so cooked like a turnip. You can roast it just like a vegetable. And then we have Saramama, who's the goddess of maize, so, or corn. So corn actually doesn't, can't grow at as high of an altitude as potatoes can. Um, as you can imagine, when something's in the ground, it's protected from some of those things that I had mentioned to you before. But when something's growing out of the ground, um, it is affected by the wind and all of that, all of that stuff. So we have Sara Mama, we have Quinoa Mama, we have Coca Mama, all of these different goddesses who um, who take care of these specific crops for us, and uh, we're we're prayed to, we're offered to um, in this in this whole process. So um, same thing. So the kaniwa up there is similar, is a similar grain to, uh, to quinoa. And quinoa and, and kaniwa actually can be grown at those really high levels. OK, so intricate family networks of kin um, are known as ayus. An ayu can be hundreds of people deep. And they actually go 
vertically. So everything, you can think of everything in the Andes as reciprocal. So I give you something, you give me something, or I give your kids something, then your kid will give my kids kids something. Like everything is trade because there's no money. And also vertical. Everything goes from, bottom, from top to bottom. The rain, the snow melt, the water, the crops, the llamas, all of that. All of that good stuff. And so if you are a llama herder at the very, very peak of the mountain, you do not have time to grow potatoes, maybe 100 feet lower on this terraced farming. And if you are growing quinoa, you don't have time to grow um, peppers or corn down at closer to sea level, so on and so forth. So these trading systems developed, but they can become very complicated. So now there's a kinship, like a tribe kind of created that's like, okay, within our tribe, we will have people at the top of the mountain, um, uh, like the highland parts, uh, with the llamas and alpacas, that are gonna cultivate all, uh, cultivate all of the animal products and send them down to the, to the uh, terrace farmers, which will send them down to the ground level farmers, which will send them down to the coastal farmers that are collecting oysters and fish and all of that. And we all agree that we're gonna send stuff to one another. And you don't have to worry if like their trade agreements fell apart because you are loyal to your own people. So what did the lowland, uh, so we, we really mostly focus on the highland parts of the mountain because those are the most extreme and I think the most unique compared to what we learn about with European and, um, and North American history in agricultural ways. Um, but these other parts were, were also extremely important. So the lowland settlements produced coca leaves, peppers, uh, cassava, we call it yucca. Um, gourds, and um, of course, the rainforest products. That was more on the East Coast. And the coastal people grew corn, cotton, and they fished. Well, that sounds a lot like what we had up here on the East Coast, too. Um, and that's because it's at sea level, more or less. And so these are the kinds of things that we have, that we have in common. So trading amongst peoples was always imperative to the survival in South America. And that predates any cities as evidenced by the, the spondylus shell, which really you can only find close to the equator. And that's not part of the Inca empire. And for thousands of years, we find these shells all down, all down the coast of South America. Um, because they're beautiful. They're spiny oysters, and they um, were used for jewelry and for um, all sorts of de decorative things, but also as status symbols. Like, we still do that today, having beautiful jewelry or a hood ornament, you know? Like, the, the spondylus shell is like the hood ornament of, <laughs> of the year 400. And so to give one civilization credit for this kind of trade is not... I don't think um, in alignment with the reality of how, how people uh, moved around, but it was highly organized through civilizations like the Wari and the Inca who were able to create these road networks and encourage, if not force, people to trade with one another and to feed into the, into the uh, city itself. And do, 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 do. So, the, so why, why study, why study their ways? Why even, why even go back and look at all of this? Like, they already lost the war. <laughs> like, they like, we already don't do that. We already have cities that stay in place. And even though our buildings fall to earthquakes and theirs didn't, we are doing it our way. So why look back? Um, I would say, I would argue uh, that our modern problems of overgrazing, lack of fresh water, and the depletion of Earth's resources can be helped by looking backwards towards a time that for thousands of years worked in many ways. It also didn't work in many ways. Like, 
I'm not arguing that life was better when we were dependent on the sun god's good grace, good mood. Um, However, when the Spanish came and conquered the land, they did their best to dissolve these ayus, these kin work, uh, kin networks, so that their loyalty would be towards the crown. And they didn't like people moving around in these semi-nomadic ways uh, because they're hard to count for a census, they're hard to tax, they're hard to keep track of. And when you take animals like llamas or even cows in this country um, or sheep, and you force them to graze on the same land year after year, land that's being depleted, it creates more and more desertification. It creates more deserts than necessary. And so many generations have passed that a lot of the technology that we talked about today um, has has actually been lost to time if not in certain ways still upheld by remote indigenous groups. So one of, the, one of the major things is the irrigation ways. That was completely shut down by the Spanish. And now we still have people living in the mountains, in the, in the Sierras, um, who don't have access to clean water for farming or to drink. But there's still snow melt, and there's still ice at the tops of these mountains for now, luckily. So for the past 30 years or so, the instead of just looking at these and saying, wow, that's such a cool thing that happened in the past, it's like, wait, how did they do this? And how can we actually reinstate some of these methods into the infrastructure where these people are still, li- like, people are still living? And they're doing it with, with pretty good success, actually. So now we're able to reincarnate these ancient systems of water rerouting to help modern day people. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, which is a joke because the Inca didn't have wheels because the roads were too rocky. Um, they did, they didn't not invent the wheel, it's just wheels are not very useful in, a, in terrain like this. The other Ah, yes, terrace, far- terrace farming kind of never went away. Like, we just kept building upon that. Um, although here, obviously, there's no farming going on on it because this is Machu Picchu, and it's a UNESCO historical site, and it's like a museum, for lack of intent, for uh, lack of a better word, but it's a tourist attraction, um, or it has become a tourist attraction. And um, But we do see, see terrace farming other places, in the world now as well. Okay. Um, ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. Okay, I just spoke a lot. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Yes. Uh, okay, so the question is, do uh, so I'm, just, I'm repeating the question so that the people on YouTube can hear can hear through the mic, um, is, uh, is it llama or llama? So double L in Spanish is ya, like yam. Yes, you can. Um, so the word, so the word llama um, doesn't come from Spanish. It comes from, mm-hmm. and so you get, you can say it either way, and people will know what you're talking about. One of the things is that, like, so the word llama in Spanish also means flame, like a candle with a flame, la llama, um, and then, like, but within the context of the sentence, like, they would know if you meant a flame or a, la, or a llama or a llama. Um, but in English, we say we say llama, and everyone listening is listening in English. So, but yeah. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. 
Oh, do you? Yeah, I could talk about him a little bit. Um, so the, the question is about the double-headed rainbow. So, uh, so to you is the god of rainbows, and the belief is that, or the story goes, that it is a double-headed dragon with a rainbow body, and you don't know that it's a dragon because you never see the ends of the rainbow. But if you were to see the ends of the rainbow, you would see two dragon heads. And this is actually the child of one of the magical children of White the Bayana. Where'd she go? And her, her lover, Aymaru, the king of dragons, uh, god of dragons. And so the rainbow eye has a lot of uh, significance in, in, um, in Inca lore as well, because one of the other promises was that when the golden staff of Manco Capac sunk into the ground, a rainbow would appear over the promised land. And we actually have a few, um, a few dragons uh, that, that have, have some stories uh, within the lore that sometimes they get, they get into trouble and are quite mischievous, but Chuyu is more of a peaceful, of a peace, I mean, he's a rainbow, uh, their rainbow. And, um, and yes, does that answer your question? Yeah. Tell me. Uh, so the question is um, from how have Quechua words and indigenous foods kind of, oh, like in my own life? Yeah, like come more into my own life. All right. So a lot of the words that I kind of grew up learning, like in my household, I just would call them Spanish. Um, but then it turns out that they come from Quechua, like quinoa or um like, we don't say maize, which is, or like in English, you'd say maize, which is corn. Um, or like they call it that, like in Mexico too, but we call it choclo. And um, yeah, so it's more of like learning like a bunch of the words that, that I just didn't realize, like what the etymology was, like where they had come from. Uh, hasn't super, cha super changed my speech because I don't have any like Kichwa, native Kichwa speakers like in my life where I could even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I'm just going off of like videos that I've seen of native speakers and do my best to emulate and do them justice. Um, but when it comes to the food, I love food and I love, uh, what's it called? Love exploring with new ingredients. And we actually locally in Framingham have great places to get these uh, ingredients. Uh, one great place is on Hollis Street. It's called Tesoros, Tesoros Market. And they have, um, they have like the potatoes that, that I grew up eating in Peru. And they're frozen, right? They're imported in, in, in a frozen state. That's one thing, too, that, right, so, you know, you, if you've had potatoes in your house, um, you know that they kind of, ha they do have a shelf life where they'll start to, like, grow these little roots and whatnot. Um, and they really have to be under ideal conditions. But if you're trying to feed your whole family on junio, which is like, or like on potatoes, um, you need your whole harvest to survive. So ingeniously, they came up with this method of freeze drying their food by using the mountain. <laughs> so they were able to freeze dry potatoes and it creates a product called junio, which is uh, like dehydrated, really, really shelf stable, stable potatoes that you didn't reconstitute with hot water, like on a stove. And so through freeze drying, that also allows all of the, it also allows things to be transported from place to place and you don't have to worry about the temperatures fluctuating and all of that, you don't have to worry about things spoiling. Um, so I've just been having a lot of fun with, um, yeah, we're trying to cook up new things and digging up new recipes and yeah.
Kino, yeah, so Kino's was, Keen was really had a moment in, as I think a lot of people maybe that have like heritages outside of um, uh, the northern United States uh, feel that like there's like moments and fads that happen in uh, like in this area that are like, oh, we're all, oh, we're all doing poke bowls now. Like, oh, we're just like delving into Hawaiian like foodstuffs. Um, I feel like quinoa is one of those things. Um, avocados was like, nobody even knew what an avocado was when I was a little kid, and now they're $14 when you put them on toast. Um, and like, oh, chia seeds are another product of South America. Like, everyone loves chia seed pudding. That's, a, um, that's one of those as well. The potatoes were originally, potatoes were originally created and domesticated in, in South America. And it wasn't until the Europeans came and took them back that the Irish even got them. Which, like, they probably should, yeah, yes, question. Yeah, so uh, the comment was um, that we thought that the potatoes originally came from Ireland and Europe. And they actually come from South America. Yeah, as well as tapioca, because tapioca comes from, uh, which uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan get a lot of credit for that because they created bubble tea. So fun. Love what you guys did with it. But that comes from cassava, which we call yuca. Um, and that is also a South American or an America's um, product that was then brought to Asia and they created their own, their own stuff out of it. Yeah, so, yeah, you can think of, okay, so the comment was about boxed potatoes, like what they make at, in cafeterias, like powdered potatoes. Um, not exactly junior, but not, not junior. I mean, I w we wouldn't call it that, not with all the other stuff in it, but yeah, same idea. Same idea. It, it makes it really shelf stable and um, a lot when it's a, uh, yeah. Question about guinea pigs. Yeah, where is she? Got some guinea pigs up here for you at her feet. So guinea pigs are really fun. So they're called, they're called gooey. And they, they serve multi-purposes within the household. So within the permanent structures that the Inca and the Wari created, um, guinea pigs are, are, so it's like a, there's multiple rooms. But in the main room that has the kitchen and the hearth, are guinea pigs, and they live on the floor. So it's like dirt, straw, guinea pigs, and they just they just hang out in the house, and they're used as live composting. So literally, they you're just like you know peeling your potatoes or whatever, and you just like you can just like let it fall to the floor, and the guinea pigs will eat it all, and then you can use their droppings to fertilize your garden plots outside. And if you're hungry, you can definitely eat them. They, everything serves multi-purposes, multi-purposes here. They even have guinea pigs now that have long hair that you can, you can comb out to make fur, uh, to make wool. I'll like yarn out of their spun, long, glorious coats. Although uh, that was not, I think that's more of a, um, modern-day privilege that we have, that we can, that we can have enough woolly uh, guinea pigs to do that with. I don't think that was used as like a, a main source of clothing uh, back in the day. Yeah. Little guinea pigs. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Mm -mm -mm. The, when it comes to weaving, too, the when it comes to uh, when it comes to weaving, the colors and the patterns really matter. So this is one of the things that's like kind of become trendy um, that we see a lot is like indigenous created 
crafts from South America or even Central America and in Peru as well. They have um, in Peru, in, in Mexico and, and like El Salvador, they have these like brightly colored, I have one on the back table, um, borders with the stripes and all of that. That, all the motifs have their own meanings to them. And it was actually a way for women to teach their daughters how to count and memorize uh, because the number of stitches and like the weave in and the weave out and all of that um, has to be very particular to get the same pattern again and again. So even though it wasn't like, here, this is the number one, here, this is the number two, instead it was through, through these um, textile creating patterns that girls were taught how to do such things. When it comes to, uh, Oh, so some of the most amazing um, blankets as well. I wish I had brought a photo. That's okay. Um, they show geographical happenings. So the, a lake, a pond, something like that, but from a bird's eye view that a person who does not have a hot air balloon or a helicopter or a, a drone would have no reason to actually be able to know what the shape is. But by walking around the lake or the the, the um, pattern, the geographic pattern, they were able to reproduce that into their weavings like perfectly. So like now if you go up and look down, you're like, that's the exact shape and dimension of the lake reproduced on this, on this blanket. Um, and it was just through walking and understanding the number of paces versus distance, um, which is pretty magical and incredible. Some honorable mentions um, when it comes to when it comes to all of all of this stuff is Inti, the sun god. We spoke about him last time. Uh, Mamakia, the moon goddess. Um, as uh, the tides change and the moon, the moon has to do with all of that. Uh, Goyur, the goddess of stars, and she's she's up there with Mayu, the the Milky Way, and um, the stars were read to know when the seasons were. And like Urpikuya, so the, the llama-headed god, he is, he's a constellation. So a lot of these um, gods and goddesses are constellations. So you would speak to that, speak to that constellation, speak to that god, and they would watch over your crops or your herd and, and whatnot. Um, and I just didn't want to. I don't want to repeat myself from last time about all of those gods and goddesses again. But I have them in the back as well. Jaska, goddess of dawn. Um, she she's associated with flowers. Flowers we think of as frivolous, like oh they're just they're just for show. But flowers are actually what becomes the bud that becomes the fruit. Um, so no flowers, no fruit, no fruit, no food. Um, so. Yeah. Any last any any last questions about anything at all or do do okay. As many as they'll let me. Um actually something that would be oh so the question is how many more lecture series um do I have? I could obviously talk about I could obviously talk about this all day. Um but I would love to have feedback on the evaluation forms about topics that are interesting to you about this area and like time period of, of the world. Um, I think last time somebody wrote Norse mythology and it was like, awesome, love that. Like, I'm not that guy. Um, I, could probably, I could probably talk about Norse mythology more than like your average person, but I cannot do an entire PowerPoint on it. But when it comes to Andean life, like South American, Western South American life or beliefs, um, if you guys have topics that are, you're interested in, you can let me know because I either already could give a talk about it or I could veer my research in that, in that direction to fill in the gaps. Um, if you're like, how do you even know all of this stuff? Um, I brought, uh, there's a table back there with um, a bunch of my sources. So books on the subject and um, there's like 15 National Geographics back there, and there's one article in each of them that covers something that helped me create this. So, um, and I, I read like academic journals and stuff like that about about the subject. And 
I just generally nerd out about all of this. So I would love to hear what you guys are interested in so that I can um, bring you what you're interested in. And that'll decide how many, how many more I'm invited to come and, and display. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, feel free to hang out after. And uh, if you have questions about the art as well, I brought some of the sketchbooks that were like behind the behind the scenes of like creating those pieces. And um, that's it. Thank you very much.